It's both an honor and a pleasure to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker for the day, Lorcan Dempsey. Lorcan brings with him a wealth of experience as a librarian, having worked in library, nonprofit, and education organizations across Ireland, the UK, and the US. His profound influence on library directions, not only in the US and Europe, but also globally, is widely acknowledged. Throughout his career, Lorcan has played key roles in, the, in overseeing the National Library and informational programs in the UK, as well as managing two renowned library research and development units, UKOLN and OCLC Research. Lorcan's outstanding contributions in the field have earned him numerous accolades, including an honorary doctorate from the Open University in the UK and the prestigious IFLA Medal. Today, Lorcan will present his views and insights on the library and the relational turn. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lorcan as he takes the stage. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, heavier than I, I for the last uh, couple of days. Um, when I came in, a couple of folks said, uh, oh, you're taller than we expected. Well, um, now I'm heavier. The, um, during the pandemic, my, my special interest uh, was fonts, uh, you know, typefaces. I know everybody in the audience is probably equally. Put in and out. Is that my um, the, uh, this font uh, uh, called Biblio, and it's the only font I can find uh, that was developed in or by a library. Uh, so it was actually developed to, uh, uh, for signage in the library at the Royal Academy of Hague. So if anybody knows of another font that was developed uh, by or in a library, I'd be, I'd be very interested. The world of fonts is really interesting because it combines sort of business issues, cultural issues, ideological issues in ways that uh, most people live uh, this too. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, use that font because it's quite heavy, so I'm switching to uh, switching to this one. The, I'm going to talk about the academic library relational turn. I, I'm going to have a library perspective. We all see the world from the rock we sit on. I sit on a library rock. I'm conscious that the audience is, is quite diverse, so um, this, this, uh, this really is uh, uh, a library perspective, but looking out uh, more broadly. These are my children. Um, the, this, uh, this morning, I put this in this morning because it occurred to me we have uh, lived and worked in the uh, UK, Ireland, and the US, which, you know, are all English language speaking uh, countries, but I was quite struck by the fact that uh, audience, I think, I have two third culture uh, children who don't know where home is. Um, and their natural milieu is the airport or the train station. Um, and this is a rare occasion when they're actually talking to each other, <laughs> which tended to happen in airports and, uh, and train stations, if not at home. Th this is a few. Uh, generative AI, um, um, perplexity AI was mentioned in, in one of the sessions I was in. Okay. Thank you. I do have a very big head, by the way. <laughs> the um, perplexity AI was mentioned uh, yesterday several times. Um, I, I thought it'd be interesting. Perplexity AI is, is you, you, you can get a uh, plugin uh, uh, for Chrome or Edge or whatever, and it combines search and uh, the language processing abilities of ChatGBT or whatever. So I, I think uh, this, this is an inkling towards our future. We're going to have Chewies, Chewies, chat user interfaces. So you're going to have a conversational interface to lots of things. I just went to the website here, uh, used the uh, Perplexity AI plugin, 
and I just asked a question, uh, tell me about Amical 2023. And it actually gave me quite a nice answer, I think. Now, what it's done is it's gone to the website here, it's pulled back the documents that mention Amical, and then it's used the large language model, it's used its AI abilities to summarize those, to give a, to give a view of, you know, what's... So it's actually quite nice. Uh, sometimes it, 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 it does, it gets things wrong. So in 2023, the Amical conference was held in Rome, Italy. Um, now, I don't know whether originally it was meant to be there, or we're really in Rome and we're, we're, it's a consensual hallucination, um, but uh, it, it's, it's an interesting example. Apart from the Rome thing, this is actually very impressive, I, I think. So I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, uh, I think, as was said yesterday, every, everything comes in threes. So uh, the library and the university, the relational library, the library and the consortium. And uh, thinking about a relational element in each. So part one, I tried to move the cursor in the middle there. I, I couldn't with the... Um... Third time's the charm. Oh, really? Does this not work either? Well, everything, everything comes in threes. <laughs> so, uh, part one, the, the uh, library in the uh, university. We did, we did some work a few years ago, uh, topically funded by the Mellon Foundation um, with uh, Ithaca uh, SNR, uh, looking at some of the uh, characteristics of uh, higher education in the context of thinking about the future uh, of libraries. And we came up with a little model so that typically universities will have three uh, focuses, foci, um, uh, education, distinctive focus on, on baccalaureate education, uh, career increasingly important in a variety of places, preparation for professions, and then a uh, distinctive focus on doctoral research. Not that universities do one of these things, but they have different balances of the three. These are universities in the New York region, and we've used uh, US government data to actually characterize them along those axes. And I did this because of Kathy's presentation yesterday. CUNY is an absolutely wonderful uh, institution, but, but, but somewhat hard-pressed. Hard but um, from a social mobility point of view, um, um, really advances students. But these are uh, institutions, so, so not really surprising. Um, Vassar and Sarah Lawrence, liberal arts colleges, almost entirely focused on liberal education. Very little uh, uh, thinking about careers, very little uh, 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 research focus. Columbia, New York University, and Rutgers, surprisingly, um, um, almost the same profile. Uh, surprising that Rutgers is quite as high, but, but you know, uh, large major research institutions. CUNY is a, a system of lots and lots and lots of uh, institutions of varying types, community colleges as well. And this is the average of CUNY, um, but it's only those uh, CUNY uh, colleges that submit this uh, type of data. So it's not the uh, iPads data, it's not the full range. If you look closer within CUNY, you see that it has different types of institution. And these are the three peak institutions. So it has the graduate school, which is very research focused, and you can see the way it uh, uh, peaks up at the top, the gray. You have Hunter College, very liberal arts focused, it comes down. And then uh, City College of Technology, uh, uh, its name is a clue that it uh, has uh, this um, career uh, focus. So if you think about these, Things. What, what has been happening in the last few years, accelerated by the pandemic, is universities really thinking about what their focus is, what their, you know, where they sit in the environment, and thinking about the mix of those three things. If you look at statements, you know, Hunter, liberal arts and sciences, a more just and inclusive society, individual development, that liberal arts uh, focus that you'll be uh, very familiar with, uh, city tech, then, is skilled war workforce, post-war economy, high-tech workforce. It talks about itself in a very different way. So what we're seeing is, I think, a slight sharpening of the way in which institutions are talking about themselves and, and what they do, because they, they really, because of the competitiveness that was spoken about yesterday, uh, um, they have to begin to think about where do they actually fit in in this uh, environment. 
This is Gandhi. I don't know whether that's Paul through the window in the, in the, in the uh, background. Um, now, I, I put this up for two reasons. One, uh, because apparently I'm told that if you touch one of his ears, it's good luck. So if you um, have time, you should do that before you leave. Uh, Paul tells me he doesn't know which ear. <laughs> and maybe if you touch the other ear, you know. The reason I put it up, and you know, colleagues from here will have to excuse me, but I, I walking out of the library, I saw the, the, the vision and mission statements written up outside the library, and it struck me that they were actually very direct. You know, a few years ago, it would all be, you know, we want to be the best in the world at, um, you know, everything. Um, but it, it was very direct. The, the mission is very focused on liberal arts education in Morocco doing things. But this then, vision, would be a beacon in the Middle East offering the best value for investment. It seems to me that's actually quite direct, and you can translate that into something that says, well, how, how do we do that? It's not very waffly, it's not, you know, it's, it's actually um, focused. So I'm just going to run over this because there's been lots of discussion about this. If you think about education generally, it does seem to me that we're seeing a situation because of everything that was discussed yesterday, really a focus on what is the distinctive value that a particular organization offers. Um, when you think about uh, learning, um, then uh, thinking about how uh, uh, student success, retention, and so on, but really thinking about sort of life-wide learning. We're familiar with lifelong learning, but life-wide learning. How do you cater for the full width of the student's experience so that they feel that they belong, so that they feel welcome, so that they feel that this is a place where they're going to thrive and prosper. So life-wide learning, I think, um, 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 uh, very important. And if you think about the library, hugely critical in the library context. Research, uh, increasingly computational angle, and that will be accelerated by the developments that we're all surrounded by. And then that third mission, the, the community, the uh, role in society, um, but certainly drives an interest in uh, policy and expertise contributions, but also a desire to make expertise visible. Um, you know, if, if your expertise is not visible, then nobody knows you're an expert. So when you think about profiling, research information management systems and so on. At the same time, uh, a growing interest in uh, social justice, but also from the point of view of management, from the point of view of uh, student care, wellness, uh, um, um, the burden on faculty, growing interest in empathy, equity, or a growing focus or a growing um, awareness. So against that background, this, I mean, I have a few slides that are really the way PowerPoint should be, the way it was designed to be, you know, full of text that you, um, uh, sort of underused facility of PowerPoint. This is a picture um, by Sheila Carl, um, who is uh, ex-library director, library researcher, and it's from um, a book that I, I really highly recommend, that it's just come out, The Social Future of Academic Libraries, uh, which, which really takes, uh, it's, it's, it's very theoretical in places, it, it's, it's uh, looking at uh, practice theory, social network analysis, um, but it's sort of saying how does the library fit into the university. And thinking about life-wide learning, uh, this is a characterization by Sheila of how the library increasingly is involved through the whole student life cycle. So pre-entry, um, there may be some reach out. First year, you have first year librarians, uh, personal librarians, trying to soften the landing, uh, trying to uh, make it welcoming, belonging. And this isn't just about the service, this is about building relationships, it's about developing social capital, it's about having those students understand and recognize and value uh, the library. Uh, on course, well, of course, um, this is, uh, you know, the types of things that we're uh, familiar with. Uh, a lot of discussion about affordable textbooks. It's uh, CUNY, a pioneer there. Um, it's uh, the types of things that libraries do and always do. But in a broader way, I think, you know, she's got things like health education, physical activities, creativity studios. 
Then pre-graduation, uh, careers collections, employer research, you know, how do you help with that preparation for the next um, step? And surprisingly, she doesn't have uh, anything in about alumni uh, services. That, one of the most confusing words in the world, uh, alumni, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know alums to get over the problem of whether you say alumni, 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 you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I think we need some standardization there. So if you think about that learning, you know, life-wide learning, the library uh, has a role in, in sort of belonging, uh, skills, career information, social space, alone space, specialist expertise, exhibitions, events, specialist equipment, leisure reading, and then critical research and increasingly uh, computational uh, literacy. So that sort of life-wide emphasis. And that clearly involves a relational element. You have to engage with uh, teaching and learning centers, student services, students' union, writing center, bookstore, uh, learning management, that whole range. If you're taking a life-wide perspective, you're taking a campus-wide perspective, and you are in a uh, relationship with uh, a variety of others. And you know, some examples, this is uh, Occidental College, a liberal arts college in California, looking at stu students and faculty building exhibitions on the special collections. So you have unique materials with special stories, you know, contextualizing, narrative building, storytelling, sense making. Uh, well-being collection, I was talking to somebody about Bath Spa University the other day. I worked at the University of Bath beside this for a long time. And uh, the well-being collection, improve your well-being, th whether through enhancing your cooking skills or, so uh, again, a life-wide um, perspective. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't realize that I was doing this, moving from cooking to sewing. Um, uh, and and uh, regrettably, uh, you know, you, you probably immediately notice that they're all women in this picture, which I think is, um, I'm, but anyway, I'm surprised that they, this is uh, Lancaster University, uh, again in the UK. So the library has mending station sessions. So you can bring in clothing and they, they help you um, uh, work, you know, they, they, they have uh, facilities, equipment uh, to repair clothes, to do whatever. And again, it's a well-being type of activity, but they link it to a variety of partnerships. They sort of reach out and do other things uh, on campus. They also link it to academic discussion of um, um, uh, well-being, but of uh, this um, type of uh, activity. But again, it's that life-wide um, perspective. So increasingly life-wide and life cycle. If you think about research, uh, it's the same thing. You have to sort of focus on the uh, life cycle. This is a picture from Carnegie um, Mellon University, and obviously very research intensive. But it's their view of the research life cycle. And what they try and do then is say, well, what types of services can we provide that support stages in the life cycle? Now, Carnegie Mellon has lots of money, has lots of resources and they're very focused on research. So I'm just putting this up as a very full picture. Not many universities would do this range, and certainly if you're more focused on education, you wouldn't do um, all that much of it, but it just shows. And I think uh, what it does show is how increasingly throughout the whole research life cycle, um, people consume and create data. The whole research life cycle is informationalized. Information isn't in a bucket over in the library. The whole life cycle is informationalized. You consume and you create data at all stages. And increasingly, you have to manage what you create. Somebody has to manage what you create, as well as using things. So again, if you think about this uh, from a relational point of view, this means if the library is providing services here, it has relations with Office of Research, thinking about expertise profiles, compliance to open access or national mandates or uh, analytics. Uh, some discussion yesterday about ranking bibliometrics. The library is very involved now in bibliometrics, helping universities do better in rankings. Uh, one thing really quite interesting, there's a single harvest available. Um, um, Dolly the Sheep. Uh, was developed in a research institute at the University of Edinburgh. 
When people published about that, did they always say that they were from the University of Edinburgh? No, because they were from this institute. So University of Edinburgh didn't necessarily get all the credit in the rankings. So one of the things that libraries have been very active, um, Case Western Reserve University. I mean, what sort of a name is that? Uh, Ooey Pooey, um, Indiana University, uh, Purdue University, Indianapolis. I mean, what sort of a name? In, in the context of international competition, how can you ca call yourself ooey pooey? But the, the issue is that when it comes to faculty writing, you know, Case Western Reserve University, sometimes they're Case, sometimes they're Case Western. And what this means is that when it comes to Elsevier doing the rankings, they're doing it algorithmically, they may not. So Trinity College Dublin, Case Western, Various institutions have reported a one-time bump from bibliometric work that enhanced the way in which they were visible in these services. So we can, uh, whatever you think about rankings, people play in that space. And again, a life cycle. You're managing inputs, managing outputs. Increasingly, there are workflow systems that have to be managed. Expertise and promotion is a managed, you know, university profiles, faculty profiles, bibliometrics. And uh, my former colleagues at uh, OCLC Research have done a lot of work on sort of research data, research. And uh, one of the phrases that we quite liked was social interoperability, social interoperability on campus. If you think about research support, all of these people are very active in research support. You know, the library is not the only player here. And really, a lot of this depends on personality, politics, history. It's not like oh, it's our job to do this. Well, no, it's this person started doing this 10 years ago and made a success of it and was asked to do more of it. So there's that sort of discretionary element. So it's inevitably political, negotiated, discussed. And that means that, you know, you have to secure buy-in, know your audience, speak people's language, offer. So there's a whole range of soft skills, social skills, political skills that have become much more important, um, that were much less important when people knew what the library was and they went to it. Um, so you have discussions about relationships and boundaries and whose job is what, importance of soft skills, what are the priorities. Now, um, uh, librarians would be very familiar, you know, libraries developed this embedded model, the embedded library model. They, you know, a librarian was part of a research group, part of a research grant opportunity, part of, um, uh, and, you know, did, did instruction. Um, and the liaison model where they went out and did things. So really sort of beginning to think about how you engage more deeply with activity on the campus and then you have to follow that up with um, services. So if you think about uh, the library and the institution, the library, the library strategic emphasis has to take cue increasingly from the institutional goals. And those institutional goals are probably being sharpened because of competition post-pandemic. Goodness is a measure of institutional fit. Goodness is not a big library. Goodness is not lots of people coming through the front door. Goodness is how well you fit and support the needs of your parent institution. And I think we have finally moved away from the idea that Harvard is at the top of some evolutionary tree to which everybody aspires, which certainly was the case if you think about a variety of like, you know, they wanted to have big collection do whatever. Collection size is no longer an indicator of library worth. Uh, importance of alignment, you know, so you have to co-create services with the people who want them. You have to collaborate with other people on campus. You have to negotiate who does what. It's a negotiation. It's not, this is our job, we will do it. You negotiate what it is you are going to do in the context of a, an ecosystem on campus. PowerPoint is underused. Um, the, uh, so, um, thinking about the library, we used to have a, a collections-based library. The library was the collection and the library was the building. That's what, and that's what most people still think about the library as, that don't work in a library. And, you know, if you're a librarian, what, you, you end up saying, oh, but we really do more than that. You know, I mean, that's, that's the refrain of the librarian. We, you know, we, 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 we do more than that. So, the role and value of the library was well understood. Everybody knew what it was. You didn't have to explain it. It was tremendous social capital because everybody used the library. It was central to people's workflow. So you had that social capital. People knew what it was. 
value role story didn't need to be explained. They were given. People knew what they were. I um, was doing a, another presentation, and you know that very irritating um, Microsoft design feature where it proposes um, uh, designs for you if you want them? Uh, they've upgraded it, I think, now with... So this is what it gave me for generative uh, AI and libraries. It's the same library as this. This is the most photographed library in the world. This is the archetypal library. This is the long room in Trinity, Ho Trinity College, Dublin. If the New York Times wants a picture of a library, this is it. The interesting thing is it's no longer really a library. It's a tourist destination. You know, this is where you go and see the Book of Kells. You queue for 40 minutes and go and see the Book of Kells. Now, they do have real books, and they're currently engaged in a restoration process. Um, by the way, the part of the restoration is, see all those statues? They're all men. So part of the restoration is they're going to introduce some women, and they had a competition to see which women's statues should be in the new, uh, in the new uh, building. But this is, what, this is what Microsoft gave me. This is what it thinks the library is. It's that library. It's because that's the archetypal library. It's what people think. It, a library is a place with wood and buildings. That's, that's a, a library. And that's a problem for libraries. So if you think about the digital, the network, the computational AI, what we now have is a situation where the library is not central. It's one part of the digital universe. Researchers and learners used to build workflow around the library. Now the library has to go out and be in the workflow of researchers and learners. Workflows, as I said, have become informationalized. So they generate and they consume information at all steps. It's not like, oh, I have a need for information now. And so support is needed throughout the, the life cycle. And this is sort of obvious, but I think we need to be reminded that it, it, it has the dynamic, the location, the situation of the library has um, changed. So if you think about library strategy, um, I mean, I think the main reason uh, strategy is it's a story about the value, identity, and workflow for your stakeholders. It's a communications device for your staff, for, for, for your stakeholders. And it should generate an elevator pitch. The problem libraries have at the moment is that their elevator pitch takes a very high building to tell. If you want to tell the library elevator pitch, you need a 44-story building or a, you know, 83-story building. Or This is in Dubai. I actually took this picture. I sort of got a uh, pain in my neck just trying to get the, uh, get, the, uh, get the picture in. But the library elevator pitch requires a very tall building um, at the moment. Uh, this is an example I quite like. This is the uh, University of Ottawa, and this is the library website. So you go to the library website, and you've got this lovely picture facing you. You don't have a, a, a squidgy little search box and a load of libguides and, you know, uh, um, um, so, and it's bright. Now, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, she seems to be talking, and he's doing something over here, so I'm not quite sure. But it's sort of bright, and it's welcoming, and it's, it's quite nice. Their library strategy, you can see how they're trying very hard. Is this being recorded? They're trying very hard to um, switch the rhetoric. It's not about the library. It's about the library in, in the institution, or it's about the institution and the library. And I think, actually, they, they do a reasonable job. But these, these are the university goals. So they're aligning the library with the university goals. And they're more agile. So through transformative learning, such as podcasts or online tutorials, we support success in ever-changing world. A few years ago, it would be, we do podcasts. Now, they are trying to relate everything they do to uh, university goals. And if you, if you think over here at the table of contents, it's supporting open scholarship, the women's archives, unique collections documenting women's instant workshops, digital literacy. It's not here are our collections, here are our gate counts, here are our... What they're trying to do is to say, these are things that are important to the university, and this is what we're... And then at the end, they talk about, you know, the library a little bit more. When they talk about their mission, they begin with expertise. Expertise, services, collections are number three. Expertise is their lead. 
The, when it comes to the support they offer, it's expertise, innovative services, respond, evolving. So what they're trying to do is to say, we are dynamic, we move, we mobilize, we change. We're not just the place you come to. We're specialized. We do it throughout the research process. We're responsive. We participate. So it's, it's the dynamic, the rhetoric has, has uh, shifted to sort of say, we are an active participant in this institution. We're not just a place you come to to get information. We are an active participant. And here, here's another slide that's PowerPoint as it should be. Um, so uh, if you think about the collections-based library versus where people are going now, you have the value and the role of the library was well understood. Now the value and the role of the library is an ongoing negotiation. You used to optimize fixed capacities. You had technical services, you had collections, you knew what the library was. Your job was to make those things work well so that the library worked well. Today, what you're doing is you're trying to mobilize your capacities around goals that may be shifting. Oh, we now have to um, support uh, um, uh, research profiles. We now have to support, you know, so things come and, and there's a, um, space used to be configured around collections. Now space is configured around experiences. Um, collections were the passive core of service and identity. Now you're mobilizing collections and workflows, and I'll say a little bit about that. Expertise uh, used to be clear, stable. Organizations were stable. Now you have expertise, a mix of domain and relational, core expertise, social skills, research and pedagogy, and the organizations are evolving. There's no single pattern now for a library at the moment, you'll notice. Uh, people have different organizational. This is the org chart used to be well understood. All libraries were the same. Now you have quite a lot of variation. You may have sort of people, you know, research support, learning support, uh, back off, you know, but it's... Systems used to be just for managing the collection. Now you, you need systems to manage the whole library and its relationships. The library management system is only one part of the system where you have repositories, libguides, and then you potentially may provide support for research and learning workflow. <coughs> you think about collections, and this will be very library oriented, then the collections were just in case and you focused on collection building. Now, as I say, you want to actively mobilize collections within workflows purposeful alignment with learning and research objectives. And uh, there are a few emphases, I think, that we're seeing very clearly. Uh, facilitated, and I'll say a little bit um, about each of these. I'm not really going to say much about open. I think everybody has a clear uh, sense of that. A facilitated collection, we're really moving from the idea that the library just provides a bought, acquired collection to one that the library facilitates access to what people need. They organize resources around the needs of users in a network environment. So we used to have a borrowed collection, then we, had a, uh, we added a licensed collection, we added a demand or a data-driven collection, we added a variety of shared collections, shared print, shared digital, shared scholarly outputs. And then if you look at a library website, there's actually a large focus on resources that are not acquired at all. So you, you have, uh, maybe you have proxied access to Google Scholar, you have your resolver linked to Google Scholar, you include freely available eBooks in the catalog, uh, you, provide access to, uh, you provide access to open access, open educational resources, you create resource guides for web resources. LibGuides, you know, almost as successful as ChatGBT. You know, uh, you began to see one or two libguides, you know, a few years ago. And then you turn around, it's like Ivy. Every library is covered in libguides. You know, there's hundreds of libguides on, on everything. And the reason for that is, well, they're easy to manage there. But it's because you realize that, well, you know, people just don't want, you have to, you have to sort of guide them, direct them, organize them, I'm not going to ask. So uh, I went to uh, the orientation for my uh, son's uh, elite expensive uh, education, and the library um, um, presentation was all about libguides, um, you know, because that was where the students were expected to start. That was where they were expected to. Um, so uh, what you have here is, if you look at a library website, if you look at the attention, 
Obviously, collection's important and they, they require a lot of effort, but a lot of effort goes into stuff that's not owned and collected. Um, and the move online has accelerated this. Inside out collections, historically the library dealt with outside in collections. It bought things and it licensed things. It took them out in the world and brought them into users because users couldn't go out in the world and buy them individually. Today, well, people can do all sorts of things on the network, but the institution generates its own materials. It generates research data, it generates preprints. It also has special collections and archives. It has a variety of things that are institutionally specific that are of interest to the institution, but are also potentially of interest to the rest of the world, reputationally are of interest to the rest of the world. From a scholarship point of view, maybe we want to be embedded in, in networks. So the library increasingly is thinking about inside-out collections as well. I used to work, as I say, at the University of Bath, and I, 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 I thought the phrase at the top was interesting, opening up, promoting, and preserving. So part of the library's job is promoting the scholarship of Bath by pushing it out. Part of the library's job is promoting the unique resources that Bath has by pushing them out, as well as serving locally. So it's inside out. It's sharing the institutional wealth resources with the rest of the world. This is Swarthmore uh, Liberal Arts College in Philadelphia. Um, so it's sort of digitizing um, um, uh, objects uh, 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 in the three related liberal arts colleges in, in Philadelphia. They promote learning, interdisciplinary inquiry, and original interpretation. What I thought was interesting about this, though, is if you would like to cite this object in the Wikipedia article, please use the following template. So again, it's about mobilizing. It's about saying, we want this stuff to be used and visible and in the world. We want you to link to this in Wikipedia. We want Swarthmore to be visible in Wikipedia, and we're going to help you. So they're mobilizing. This is an ostrich by Picasso, <coughs> by the way. Um, distinctive. Um, this is Swarthmore again, Quaker, uh, historically Quaker institution. So they are interested in sharing with the world some of the very distinctive Quaker resources that they have. They want to share with the world the character, the distinctiveness of that uh, institution. Specialized. Increasingly, uh, libraries are thinking about how do we tailor our collections? How do we make sure that our collections are fit for purpose? How do we respond to need? And increasingly data-driven uh, uh, approach. And there are a variety of tools and services emerging to do this that it's not a just-in-case uh, library, it's something that is, the collection is tailored because we're doing inside-out collections, we're doing our distinctive stuff, so we have to make sure that what we're actually doing and showing people is what they really want, not something they might just want. Again, at Swarthmore, uh, uh, what differentiates Edwin Mayorga? Well, he's wearing a silly hat. I think, I think that's, the, <laughs> that's, the, that's the main thing. But he has a, an ORCID ID. So the library is um, uh, involved in saying, how do I make your works open access? How do I network your research output? How do I amplify the reach of your publications? How do I put your publications into places where they will become visible in scholarly networks? And this is very different than uh, where libraries started. If you think about the institutional repository or originally, it was a collections view. It was a bucket over here, and they said, come and put your stuff in here, because, so it was sort of technology as an artifact. It, it didn't sort of really take account of behaviors, incentives. And I think where we are today is very different. You're looking at the um, range of services to support research output in partnership with other people on campus, and thinking about incentives, thinking about what is it that a faculty, want, a faculty member wants to see, um, what do they care about with um, prestige. Um, a, um, we were talking about Liverpool uh, Football Club in the bus on the way over. Um, I, I know a, a UK librarian whose husband is a physicist, and she used to joke that uh, he was also a supporter of Arsenal, which uh, uh, required a lot of um, sympathy at times. And as she said, he, he and his colleagues would spend their Saturday afternoons in their living room comparing their H indexes and looking at the football. 
Um, so you know that 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 um, sense of what it is that's uh, important. So if you think about the library, the library is engaged with the full life cycle of research and learning. It has to build social capital with campus partners, faculty, and students, acknowledging that that's not as simple as just saying it. And I think it means that assessment and value uh, really being redefined. And we are in a situation where there is a need for uh, a new library story. Assessment, because typically library assessment activity does not capture the relational value of the library. It captures more tangible things. And those more tangible things increasingly are a small part of the overall value of the library. So how do you capture the full value of the library when much of that value is uh, uh, relational? Okay, the library and the consortium. Um, I, I hope people uh, aren't too irritated by that um, arrow in the middle there. What I, what I should do is have a strategic thing that floats in and the arrow points at, but I, it's too late to do that now. Okay, so I um, have worked uh, for uh, organizations. I worked for JISC in the UK, which is a national level organization that provides um, uh, technology and information services to higher and further education. So very much a shared organization. Uh, worked for over 20 years for OCLC, which provides shared infrastructure to libraries around the world. So I've actually spent a lot of time uh, writing about and working with consortia uh, because we, uh, I've been in that sort of shared um, type of uh, environment. And in doing that, it seems to me that there are four big things that uh, consortia do. They scale capacity. So that means they scale, um, you know, they have shared infrastructure, they have shared licensing. They do things together where there are scale advantages and it makes sense to do that. You know, so a lot of consortia now have shared um, ILSs, a lot are LMSs. A lot of uh, consortia have shared digital repositories. Obviously, shared licensing, uh, resource sharing. So sharing capacity, sharing capacities is a, is a big issue. They also scale learning and scale innovation. And I think this is a large part of the sticky power of consortia. Consortia are remarkably persistent and enduring. And I think that's because of the sticky power of scaling learning and innovation. They also scale influence. I mean, that's important for things like uh, RLUK in the UK or, or you know, uh, organizations that lobby and represent library interests. If you think about scaling learning, um, uh, you know, the really that soft relational power of existing networks is very strong. And, and I think, you know, that is really in, in evidence at this uh, meeting. So people want to do networking, discuss direction, they want to pool uncertainty in a safe environment. They want to say, well, I don't really know what we should be doing about this. What are you doing? Um, communities of practice, peer learning, and then arguments and evidence I think are very important. People want to go home with new arguments or new evidence, and, and you know, they, can, they can glean, gain that in this type of environment of trust. And I think, I think, as I say, there's a big issue at the moment around assessment and story. How do you think about providing ways of assessing the library that appeal to administrators that aren't all sort of warm and soft? And, um, I, you know, I was listening to the interesting overview of uh, our, our discussion about teaching and learning centers um, um, uh, in one of the sessions yesterday, and they're saying, we're the hub. Well, the library's the hub, and there's probably four or five other hubs. They're all hubs, and they can't say, well, you know, you should value us because we're the hub. Well, okay, yeah, but what do you do? Well, we're the hub. Well, what do you do? Well, we bring people together. Well, what do you do? You know, I mean, so there has to be a, a way of thinking about, you know, assessment in the context of what's uh, important to the university, and I think that's a big issue at the moment because of that story. Um, scaling innovation, I think we saw an example of this yesterday with project incubators. But basically, when you have a lot of things that you need to do and only a small amount of effort, it makes sense to try and share. Okay, we will try implementing this and we will tell you how we got on and we will share that throughout the consortium and we can see 
whether uh, by diffusing it we can scale it, whether it makes sense, whether it makes sense to do it at the consortial level, but that's actually um, very important. So if you think about learning and innovation at the moment, we're clearly at a moment when it's quite important to begin to think about these things. And so I thought I would just spend a couple of minutes uh, saying something about the topic du jour. Um, so from a library point of view, um, there's all sorts of things that you could do, and I, I just put a list up, uh, and this is not meant to be uh, comprehensive, and I'm not going to talk about it. Clearly, there's a, uh, quite a lot of education awareness advocacy that needs to happen on campus and elsewhere. I think there's major people issues, education, empathy, transparency. People need to understand what's happening in as much as they can, understand what the library or organization is doing in as much as they can, but also some transparency about uncertainty, changing roles, the way things are developing. From a demand side point of view, though, but I, I, what, what you do with the um, um, services, how, how it's going to impact, this, we're going to begin to have conversational interfaces. So what does that mean for the library? How do you do full library discovery? How do you make sure that all the services, all the expertise, uh, all the things that the library can do are available so that they can be thrown up in a conversational uh, interface? Digital services will have a new toolkit. You'll have to become familiar with a new toolkit. Publisher and vendor augmenting. So you have influencers, buyers, publishers, and vendors are going to begin doing things, need to have an informed perspective of those. And discovery is going to be blown up. It's going to, um, you know, discovery services, the type of discovery services that libraries buy. Um, who knows what's going to happen there? We're going to have new entrants. Um, the, the dominant vendors at the moment are um, um, going to have issues. Uh, deploying all of this. Yeah. What are Elsevier and Digital Science going to do with their resources? Are there going to be new entrants? So uh, that area is going to change over the next few years. So uh, perplexity, using perplexity, uh, uh, was talking about University of Sheffield um, at the dinner. So I went to the University of Sheffield and use the Perplexity plugin. I'm not searching, I'm not doing anything on the University of Sheffield website, I'm just using the Perplexity plugin, and I said, how do I add teaching resources to library reading lists? Reading lists uh, are very popular. Reading list management systems, most UK libraries have them. Uh, you know, this is basically workflow software that connects the faculty, the library, the bookstore, um, student, and it creates a workflow that means that um, things are uh, managed within a copyright context, that they're acquired, um, and um, um, uh, very prevalent in some parts of the world and totally unused in others. Um, so to add teaching resources to library, this is what it's done. It's gone and it's looked on the library website, it's found a variety of things about reading lists, it's summarized them, and it's come back and actually presented me with quite a nice list of how I go about doing it. So this is a combination of search, the AI summarization, and having information on the website. And it's giving me this interface. Now, that is very much easier than me going to the website and trying to poke around and find out where is this on the website? How do I find it? And then I'd have to look in several documents. So we're going to see this. Um, Amazon is currently redesigning its search interface to have a conversational interface. Uh, Google is going to have a conversational side on the search. So, um, you know, this is one of the things that's, uh, that's um, happening. So this, I think, throws up an interesting supply side issue. It means that you are going to have to document stuff I mean, it's the same as uh, SEO and Google. Google made people think a little bit more about websites, what they did. Maybe not enough. Kenning Arlich in the audience done a lot of work in what you should do locally to be visible externally. But you're going to have um, situations where these systems are going to be using stuff that's available. And because they're combining search and the language processing, it's no longer a situation like, GBT will tell you, oh, I'm sorry, that's after September 19, 2021. 
Perplexity combines search. Bing chat combines search. ChatGBT has just integrated search very clunkily. Uh, various other, so um, if you think about the website, you're going to have to document resources, services, expertise. You know, contextualize learning resources with resource guides, reading lists. Contextualize special collections with exhibitions, finding aids. Binding aids. So finding aids, you know, for archives, long textual descriptions, hidden, underused. I think we're going to see finding aids, you know, come into their own in, in this environment. Full library discovery. It's, you know, we tend to think about discovery as just of the catalog or something, but you want everything that the library does to be available. Promote inside out resources, use of identifiers. Okay. So this is Ohio State University, which is uh, the dominant uh, presence where I live in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it, uh, and I'm in dominant uh, quite literally. Um, the, um, um, so uh, Ohio State has uh, the uh, world's probably uh, biggest collection of political art cartoons. Um, in the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum and Library. So perplexity allows you to do a search on the internet first. So I did a search for Larry, I, tell me about Larry Ivey's home movies. So he's a big, a big person in sort of cartoon uh, land and he's got these home movies that people are interested in. So I did a search and it, it looks on the internet. I asked it to search the internet for uh, tell me about Larry Ivey's home movies. So it actually does a job. It, it summarizes. It's got a nice summary. This is actually a good result. It's got a nice summary. And then it says, the Larry Ivey collection of papers at Ohio State University includes handmade costumes that Ivey created for his home movies, including Batman, Captain Marvel, Frankenstein, and Captain America. Good result. Now, if I limit the search to Ohio State University, so now I'm limiting it to this domain. So what it's doing is it's just searching in Ohio State. It's taking what it's found, it's summarizing it, and it's giving back to me. So Larry Ivey was a filmmaker who created home movies featuring characters such as Batman. Some of his films are available in the Larry Ivey collection, blah, blah. This is a very good result. Now, I know it's a very good result. Because the creator of the finding aid from which this is drawn is my wife, who works at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum, and was absolutely thrilled when she saw this. So this is a finding aid and some other stuff that she created being thrown up as the first thing when I looked. Now, you can find it on the website, but it'll take you a while. Now, does it get everything right? No. But we're, what, five months into this, and you can do this? So, in terms of consortia, we're at a significant moment, and the relational glue that consortia have is a huge advantage. This trust, uh, you know, I, you, you can't underestimate the importance of trust. You know, when people trust each other, when they can talk to each other, share information, that relational glue, really very important. So what forms of learning and innovation could be scaled across members? If you think about AI, there's all sorts of learning that needs to happen, which is something that this type of forum is really uh, very good at. That where people can trust each other, where they're not afraid to ask silly questions, where they can get advice, where they can get guidance. And then are there any new shared capacities? So the relational turn in libraries, the library is deeply engaged with the full life cycle of research and learning, aspirational, aspirational. Build social capital and continual negotiation with campus partners, faculty, and students, ongoing. Assessment and value need to be redefined, something of a challenge. How, how do I, I can't turn all this soft power, great relationships, really helping people necessarily into, I moved this, I moved things along here, I did this, I improved that. So I think there's a, and I think um, that library story, my, um, my, my uh, own, you know, we used to talk about libraries in terms of access to information, no good. 
no good. Everybody has access to information. Everybody, you know, so information literacy, well, okay, but mm, um, the, um, so what is it? You know, libraries, I like David Lanky's, you know, libraries are about, you know, helping creation, uh, uh, helping creators in the communities they're in. But that library story, I think, is something that uh, is quite interesting, thinking about it in this new environment, and it's an area where we uh, need to uh, think uh, about things. And again, this type of forum is very good for that. So uh, if you want to get in touch with me, this is my website. This is my 49-minute read on generative AI. If you have 40, I should have said that at the beginning. You could have, you could have read it. I mean, we've just gone through 49 minutes, haven't we? Yeah. Um, and um, thank you. So thank you, Larkin, for your valuable insights and uh, ideas about the relational turn which libraries uh, have to move on. So if I put it in a sentence, uh, this is one of the things which are, we are actually trying to work at our institution, is that we are actually now thinking about how do we move from collections to services to connections. So I think this is uh, one of the areas where we have actually started working on few minutes, so we can take one question, maybe, from the audience. Alex, can you pass the mic, please? Thank you. I think this was a great overview of the moment in time that we find ourselves in <clears throat> as libraries. I do want to point out that I think librarians have the power to change the definition of libraries, but we're not doing that in an effective way still. We're not feeding the machines as we should. If you look at the definition of a library in Wikidata, it's an institution charged with the care of a collection of blah, 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 various, various things, mostly on the literary side. <clears throat> So Wikidata, by extension Wikipedia, DBpedia, feed the machines, right? They feed Google, they feed a variety of other uh, places, and, and those machines pick up this definition. Even perplexity, if you look yeah. at it now, has, yeah. has picked up that yeah. same definition. We could change that definition, mm -hmm. but we're not doing it. I think there is an agency issue there that uh, who does that because as an individual library, are, are you responsible for changing all the definitions around the place? That, that said, I think it is a very fair point. For those of you who don't know, I mean, the reason I joked uh, with um, Kenning uh, there was I, I sort of had anticipated he might ask a different question. Um, uh, Kenning, over the last few years, has done a lot of work on how libraries can, in fact, influence um, uh, social networks, search, various other things. And I think it's fair to say, though, that libraries in general tend to be uh, quite passive about that. And I think that's because there's a collections mentality. It's about building a collection. And a website is like a collection. But, y y you know, you go into other enterprises, you go into other areas, building a website doesn't put you on the web. Building a website puts you on the web, but does it mean that you are found by Google? Does it mean, you know, so what about SEO? What about um, um, the way in which it's presented. What about storytelling alongside? So just putting stuff on the web, and, and there's, there, there is a sort of, so um, when we think about what's happening, what's coming, you have to really think about mobilizing your expertise, your collections, information about those things in various places, and that requires active work to do that. SEO, for example, is work. Uh, registering identifiers is work. Simply being is not, um, is, is not enough, I think. Um, and Wikidata is a fundamental piece of infrastructure that feeds lots of other things. Um, now, what perplexity will do is it goes for the, what's most commonly said. I think libraries, and this is why I emphasize story, libraries are, 
are, and that's why, you know, I don't like the sort of um, uh, lists of libraries that you get. And I really hate it when libraries circulate, you know. There's this list of the 10 most wonderful libraries in the world. And you know what they are? They're all buildings full of wood and books that uh, are ornaments. They're not real libraries. And they're feeding an old-fashioned view of libraries that's, that's damaging to libraries because it, it means that people don't know what libraries do, what they're, what they're about. Um, but that common sense, that view of, of libraries that, you know, faculty quite often will have a view of the library that reflects their undergraduate um, education or a nostalgic view. So that view of what it is that the library now does or can do is sort of lacking. And I think it goes back to, on a technical side, what you were talking about, but I think it also goes back to promotion, marketing, telling a story that, that those are not necessarily skills that are highly valued or that we've developed. Uh, well enough. Thanks, Lachlan. So uh, I know there are so many questions, uh, but uh, unfortunately we are out of time. So we have a breakout session post lunch, we can, which we can join in. We have actually made it uh, for the purpose that knowing that we know we won't have more time for questions. So we can have discussions there. We can also talk about the story we want to tell in the breakout sessions. So thanks again, Lachlan. Uh, so please give a round, big round of applause to him. Thanks so much.